Thank you. You may be seated. Now, what if I had not said, you may be seated? Would you have still stood up? <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 20. Tonight we're looking at verses 13 through 38. Acts chapter 20, verses 13 through 38. The farewell to Ephesus, part one. This is a long passage of scripture. It has a lot in it, as we'll see toward the end of this message. It's actually got seven different ways that you can approach it in looking at it, in studying it. We're sort of going to mix those different approaches so that we can understand the entire context as to what the Apostle Paul was actually doing in the plan of God. And I hope that will help us to understand what each one of us should be doing in the plan of God. Each of those seven different approaches do apply to us as we look at that text tonight. But first, we want to recount very briefly what we went over last week as we looked about what will happen to you if you fall asleep in church. Before we do, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his shed blood, for the rich, rich grace that you have extended to us. We thank you, Father, that it's worth living for. We thank you that, as the Apostle Paul knew, it's worth dying for. We thank you, Father, that it's worth struggling for in the face of severe physical and spiritual warfare. And, Father, we pray that you will help us to be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom someday each one of us must give an account. Whether we like it or not, we must give an account. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that you would touch the lips of this preacher and reach the hearts of each one of us here to hear the word of God, believe the word of God, and to obey the word of God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall last week we looked at a number of things, recounting them very briefly. We looked at, first of all, what is our necessary motivation for witnessing and for missions. And we saw that most of the time, if we're honest with ourselves, our real motivation is that we don't want to suffer. <laughs> we'll do anything for the Lord Jesus Christ as long as it doesn't cost us anything, as long as we don't have to suffer. And, and as long as we don't lose any money and as long as we can get all the good stuff, uh, we're, we're fine with living for Jesus. But um, Peter explained that if you're really a Christian and if you are really living for Christ, there is going to be some suffering that goes with it. There will be some loss that goes with it. There are things in this world that are very temporary, which we cling to so, so passionately and yet are really worth not very much. And Peter wrote, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. <laughs> don't, don't let it take you by surprise. It happens. Why? Because you're a Christian. That is, if you're a Christian who's living for Christ. If you blend in with the world, you know, they'll tolerate you because, after all, you're not making ways for them. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. There's coming a day when the suffering turns to joy. Remember, we talked about that a little this morning, and be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap with the caveat if we faint not when the pressure comes when the suffering comes when the difficult times come we need to remember that there is an eternal future the things that are seen are temporal but the things that are not seen are eternal keep your eyes focused on the eternal things instead of keeping your eyes focused on the temporal things if you focus on the temporal things the stuff that goes on here in this world all the things that we want all the, the desires that we have if you focus on those things you're going to be discouraged if you focus on those things you'll find that life isn't worth living but if you keep your eyes focused on heaven those are the eternal things those are the things that last forever those are the things that are worth working for Remember we talked about works this morning? Works not related to salvation or sanctification, but works related to a harvest, works related to rewards, works related to something that does not pass away, that is reserved for us forever in heaven. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be also exceeding glad with exceeding joy. 
If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. <laughs> you know, if somebody begins to criticize you for being a Christian, you know what that means? Is the spirit of glory and the spirit of God is resting on you. Is that something to be happy about? Would you be glad if you could see the, the glory of God around you? That's a reference to the Shekinah glory. You remember what the Shekinah glory was? The Shekinah glory was what led the children of Israel through the wilderness. That pillar of fire by day, that uh, by, of cloud by day, and that pillar of fire by night. That was the, the Shekinah glory that rested over the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. That was the, the glory of God that filled the temple and drove the priests out at the dedication of Solomon's temple. The spirit of glory and of God rests on you. When you're criticized for being a Christian, when you're persecuted for being a Christian, when you're suffering for being a Christian, remember the eternal things. They can't see it, you can't see it. But the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. That should give you a thrill in your soul to know that at that very moment God is being glorified in you. Someday we'll see it. Someday we will see the Shekinah glory of God and the flaming angelic seraphim which compose the, that Shekinah, that glory. Shekinah, Shekinah, that's the dwelling place of God. Someday Jesus said we're going to be with him where he is, there will you be also. Where does he live? He lives in the Shekinah glory. That means the dwelling place of God. He's preparing a place for you. And if he goes and prepares a place for you, he will come again and receive you unto himself that where he is, there ye may be also. Dear friends, forget the temporal. Focus on the eternal. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And that's what gave us the introduction to how do you keep from being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We gave you three rules. Number one, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Rule number two, keep your heart obedient to the Bible. And we gave you verses you remember on each one of these. And rule number three, always tell the truth. The world is going to try to make you have a false shame. You're a Christian and they scorn you and you feel sort of embarrassed. That's false shame. Keep your eyes focused on the eternal and you will not be ashamed. Keep your eyes focused on the eternal and you will, you will have the spirit of glory and of God resting upon you. Keep your eyes focused on the eternal and there will be peace in your heart and there will be an expectation of things to come. For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Second Timothy 1.12 Someday God is going to be ashamed of some of us, but of others he will not be ashamed. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. But of those who are not ashamed of Christ, both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Why? Because they focused on the eternal. That's what it tells you in the next verse. They didn't focus on the temporal, they focused on the eternal. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. God has prepared for them a city. What did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is therefore. Jesus is therefore. God, precisely. God prepares a place for them in Hebrews. Jesus said, I am preparing the place for you. They're both talking about heaven. The only conclusion you can come to is our Lord Jesus Christ is in fact God in the flesh. So the real question we asked was, what would Jesus do or expect me to do in our situation where we are not ashamed for him? 
And with that in mind, we talked about the weariness of missions. And Paul reminded us of at least 11 different things dealing with that issue in 2 Corinthians 11. He reminded us of his first motivation for missions, his love for the church. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, his love for the church. Second, his fear for the church. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches on another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. His love for the church, his fear for the church. Third, his divine call to the church. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Fourth, his training and preparation for ministry to the church. You understand how long it takes to prepare for ministry? The training that God expects the commitment that it takes, because it is spiritual warfare to prepare for ministry. It's not merely preparing for a job. It's preparing to do battle, and Satan wants to knock out as many Bible school and seminary students as he possibly can before they ever get to the field. He does not want another soldier on the field. But look at Paul, his divine call to the church. For I suppose I was not a whip behind the very chiefest apostles. God gifted him with every one of the apostolic gifts. There was no way in which Peter was superior to Paul or any of the other apostles. He was on a co-equal basis with every one of them. His training and preparation for ministry to the church. But though I be rude in speech, yet in not, not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. He tells us in two other places that he was a student of Gamaliel, one of the seven greatest rabbis in all of Jewish history. And Paul was his student. Paul had been thoroughly trained in the scriptures. We saw his sacrifice for the church. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself so that you might be exalted because I preached unto you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man may stop me of this boasting in all the regions of Achaia. So his love for the church, his fear for the church, his divine call to the church, his training and preparation for ministry to the church, his sacrifice for the church. That brings us to verse 11, his protection of the church. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that will I do. And here he is protecting them. Here's the mother hen guarding her little chicks from the hawk. That what I do, I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory they may be found even as we. I'll protect you. He's willing to die for them. A husband who loves his wife is willing to die for his wife. A, husband, a father who loves his children, or mother who loves her children, is willing to die for her children. Paul said, I'm willing to die for you. Paul risked his life continuously to protect the body of Christ. So have many pastors and missionaries and Christian leaders down through the centuries, and many have given their lives. We see his exposing the enemies of the church in verses 13 through 15, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. And then the verse that we read you this morning, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There are good rewards and there are bad rewards too. We saw his willing embarrassment for the church in verses 16 through 21. I say again, let no man think of me a fool, if otherwise yet a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of, boast, of boasting. You see, people, people tended to criticize the Apostle Paul. They said, oh, that little jerk. Yeah, he's a, he's a squeaky little character. 
crummy voice, not very good presentation, and look how little he is. And <clears throat> You know, he's, he's telling you all this stuff. Who does he think he is anyway? Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also, for you suffer fools gladly, seeing that ye yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Paul says, I never did any of those things, but you've got some people that are doing that. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Albeit, wherein any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. That was his willing embarrassment for the church, his qualifications for church ministry. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. His personal deprivations for the church. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Twice I suffered shipwreck. A day and a night I have been in the deep. You know, I think if I had been Paul, I would not want to get on a boat. And we went through it three times. Twice by the time he gets here and writes to Corinth. A night and a day I've been in the deep. Hmm, floating around for a long time at one point. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in the perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weakness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. That was his personal deprivations for the church. His care for the church. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. You know, today a lot of people talk about burnout. Oh, that's one of the things we want to avoid, isn't it? We don't want to have burnout. Did you know Paul had burnout for the church? He says so in verses 29 and 30. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I am not burned not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of those things which concern my infirmities. Paul was willing to burn himself out for the church. His love for the church, his fear for the church, his divine call to the church, his training and preparation for ministry to the church, his sacrifice for the church, his protection of the church, his exposing the enemies of the church, his willing embarrassment for the church, his qualifications for church ministry, his personal deprivations for the church, his care for the church, his burnout for the church than his honesty for the church. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Everything I've told you, says Paul, is true. And then finally, his risk for the church. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. Oh man, how many people wanted to catch Paul. <laughs> And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. The weariness of missions. Then we thought about these verses in the context of Acts, and it's not merely the weariness of missions, it's the weariness of ministry. You need to remember the thousands of faithful men who have made it possible for you to be here tonight so that you could hear the word of God. When we thought about those verses in the context of our text here in Acts and the stress that Paul's missionary and ministry work put on him, the stress of many farewells with people that Paul loved, that's where we are tonight, where he knew that that would be the last time he would ever see them. The stress of walking hundreds of miles, the stress of preaching, the stress of short periods of time at each place, the constant threat and stress of death and assassination, the stress of caring for and providing for traveling companions, some of whom would leave him, deserters, and some of whom would get sick so that Paul would not be able to heal them. Trophimus, have I left at Melita sick? The ministry of some of his friends was truly faithful. Those were people that Paul could count on. People that Paul could count on. Do you know how important for it is for a, a man involved in ministry to have people he can count on? 
confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Some of you have been with this ministry for many years, and in that I know you are faithful. For all of us, in this ministry, are you faithful? Can the pastor count on you? Can Christ count on you? Can the body of Christ, the church, count on you? It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Not only the pastor, but all of us are stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You say, yeah, but that, that really is wearisome. Mm-hmm. It is. To be consistent, it's wearisome. To be faithful is wearisome. To hang in there is wearisome. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Just remember, faithful people are remembered and honored by God. A couple of them got their names in the Bible for being faithful. But that you may also know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and a faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. Colossians 4, 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and servant in the Lord. And then we looked at that final stress, the stress of travel and unsafe weather conditions, including the shipwrecks, which we saw just a little while ago. And finally, the stress, and I suppose this would put a little stress on me too, the stress of people falling asleep in church and getting killed. <laughs> if any of you drop dead out there tonight, do you know something? It will put some stress on me. I hope you don't drop dead here. Well, anyway, remember when that happened? That was when Paul was at Troas. That was on the first day of the week when they were there at Troas, and, and Paul was preaching a long sermon to them, preached till after midnight, and uh, Eutychus fell asleep. I mean, of course, with all the candles burning, it says there were a lot of a lot of lights burning in the place. There's not much oxygen. Easy for a guy to fall asleep, and he did and died. We learned four four lessons from that story of Eutychus and his little nap time. Lesson number one, which was certainly basic to the passage, the reason that we meet on the first day of the week and not the seventh day of the week is given to us. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ every week, not just at Easter. This was the consistent practice of the early church to point to Christ, not to the Mosaic Law. There are still people who meet on Saturday, Seventh-day Adventists and others, who say, well, we've got to meet on the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. Therefore, because Israel is the church and the church is Israel, we meet on Saturday. Others say, well, of course, we realize that they met on the first day of the week, so we'll call Sunday the Sabbath. Sunday has never been the Sabbath. Sunday is the first day of the week, always in Scripture. The Sabbath is Saturday. That was the day that God gave to Israel as a sign, a covenant sign between God and Israel. Exodus chapter 31, if we ever get there, I'll be preaching on that. But it specifically says so, that that's a specific sign between God and Israel. The covenant that God gave to Israel, which was the Mosaic Law. Third, this was to provide for a systematic and regular form of giving. And we saw Paul saying that in 1 Corinthians. And then fourth, this was the day of new beginnings. The church was new and distinct from Israel with a better set of promises. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. That was lesson number one. Lesson number two was biblical instruction is more important than travel plans. Paul decided to keep on preaching all the way through the night because he knew he was going to have to leave. And it's more important than other Sunday afternoon and evening plans. We noted both the beginning and the end of the passage. And we saw that Paul preached, ready to depart on the morrow, and then uh, he preached uh, after Eutychus was raised from the dead. That's the end of the passage, verse 11. So even a death and a resurrection was not enough to stop that worship service, although lots of things stop us from coming to the various worship services. And we gave you lots of very good tongue-in-cheek, Lots of very good excuses for why you didn't show up when the study of God's word was going on. So at the judgment seat of Christ, we have it all worked out. Hello, Jesus. Let me explain why your word and the fellowship for your people and the encouragement of the pastor and your encouragement of the body of Christ took second place, and I really had other things to do. So that brought us to lesson number three. When the Bible is being preached, stop looking at your watch. Stop thinking about what you plan to do after church or what you would rather be doing. It was a miserable service that night. Isn't it nice in here that we have air conditioning? 
Do all of you remember last year when the air conditioning went out in the middle of the Dean Bergen, or that was two years ago, in the middle of the Dean Bergen Society meetings? It was hot. It was miserable. Why is it that sometimes we meet in the prayer room when the air conditioner goes out? Did you know that people before 1950, they met in churches where all they had were those little cardboard fans? That they kept themselves in a breeze all service long? And nobody complained about it because they couldn't go home to air conditioning. They didn't have it. They had swamp coolers. You remember swamp coolers? Those things that dripped water into the bottom and then had sort of a, a mesh wick that soaked it up and then a fan blew water through that and so you had coolness but a very, very humid house with mold all over the place. I remember those swamp coolers. Dear people, what is important to you? The temporal things, the things that are seen are temporal. Are the eternal things. The things that are not seen are eternal. I can emphasize that strongly enough because I am tempted all the time by the things that are temporal. All the time. It's what bombards us every day of our life. The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. In other words, the night that Eutychus, pardon the pun, fell for the sermon, the people were serious about learning the truth about the true and living God. They weren't just playing church. They weren't attending because they always attended and because there was not something better to do. They weren't being entertained. They weren't there to gossip. They were there to be instructed in the Word of God. And they realized that might be their last opportunity. They understood the urgency of the times and of the time. And we saw that there were at least 12 reasons to be there in body as well as in spirit. Number one, personal edification, spiritual growth, and Christian maturity. Number two, example to other believers. Number three, example for your children. Number four, fellowship with those who need to be encouraged and comforted. Number five, uh, encouragement to the pastor. Number six, preparation for the future evil that God promises all those who live godly in Christ Jesus. Number seven, preparation so that you can teach others. Number eight, preparation so that if something happens to the pastor, elders, deacons, and teachers, you'll be ready at a moment's notice to step into their shoes and fill them. Number nine, you'll never have reached such astronomically spiritual maturity that you don't need the teaching. Number ten, you will have an opportunity to give an account to Christ when you stand at the judgment seat. It's not optional. Number eleven, you are losing heavenly rewards by not being here. Number twelve, you put yourself and those under you at grave risk of deadly spiritual attack if you don't take every opportunity to sharpen your sword and learn to use your spiritual armor. And that brought us to the fourth and final lesson, which was somewhat tongue-in-cheek, don't fall asleep while I'm preaching because I can't raise you from the dead. <laughs> and uh, what we need to understand is what God says about people who have good reasons for skipping church. God says something about it. People who have really good reasons for skipping church, like suffering real persecution. Do you think that's a pretty good reason? If this afternoon you'd heard on the radio that tonight, all over the United States, the military was going to come to every church where the doors were open and people were there and arrest everybody there, and take them to jail. I mean, even if they're not going to beat you, even if they're not going to hang you or kill you at that point, just take you to jail. In every community, the entire police force was authorized, and we've moved into martial law, was authorized to go around and find every church where the lights were on. Now, some would try to get away by meeting in the dark. <laughs> but where the lights are on, and, and go into that church and arrest everybody who's there. If you had heard that announcement on the radio this afternoon, would you 
be here tonight. We think of that as a pretty good reason for missing church. Did you know there was real persecution going on in Jerusalem? Hebrews 10, 24, and let, us not and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Hmm. Back to that again. We talked about the good works this morning. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's in the context of people who had had their homes broken into, their goods stolen, had lost their jobs, had suffered beatings and jail time, and they thought that was a pretty good reason to miss church. Paul, who I believe wrote Hebrews, says that's not a good reason to miss church. How much less is it a good reason to say, well, you know, I wanted to watch the football game. If we sin willfully, willful sin in context is cutting church. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful for of look of judgment and a fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. In context, Paul says, it is counting the blood of the covenant, wherewith you're sanctified an unholy thing, tre treading underfoot the Son of God, and doing despite to the Spirit of grace. Rather significant things that we ought to avoid. And so verse 13, And we went before to ship and sailed into Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when, we met, and when he met with us in Assos, we took him and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over to Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tregillium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, and have showed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house. Paul did big group meetings. Paul also did home Bible studies. He was busy, but he knew how important it was. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Did Paul let suffering stop him? When he knew it was coming, did Paul decide to go another way? Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. Paul had been through a lot of places, every place he went. God had raised up prophets, and they said to him, Paul, we know you want to go back to Jerusalem. Do you realize that if you go back to Jerusalem, they're going to arrest you, and you're going to suffer, baby. You're going to suffer. Every place Paul went, he had the impelling drive of the Spirit of God to obey the Word of God and to do the ministry to which he had been called. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Same type of words that he wrote to Timothy in the very last epistle that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy. So that I might finish my course with joy. You say, but Paul, you're suffering. How can that be joy? Do you realize that joy always shows up in the very darkest times in your life? Not happiness, joy. Happiness is our response to nice circumstances. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit that is produced by the Spirit of God when we know we're in the center of God's will and are suffering for it. That's what Peter was writing about the very first passage that I read to you tonight. 
and the ministry. And we talked about the 11 different reasons that Paul continued in his ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. There would be communication, but they'd never see him again. There would be those who would come and see him, but he would never see them again. This church that he loved, this church that he worked for, this church that he prayed for, this church that he ministered to, they would never see him again. You shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul was not selective in his preaching like most modern preachers in evangelical churches are today. He didn't pull any punches. He told it like it was. He didn't just pat them on the back and give them cotton candy. He told them when they sinned. He told them that they were not living for Christ. He challenged them. He exhorted them. He encouraged them. He wept for them. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Therefore, now he's talking to the elders, but we learn later in the passage that a lot of other people came along too. Therefore, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Oh boy, that's an exciting verse. Just a hint. What's your nearest antecedent to he hath purchased with his own blood? Those of you who know English. Which he hath purchased with his own blood. What's your nearest antecedent? God. What's that a declaration of? As we saw a few moments ago, a declaration of the deity of Christ. Paul felt perfectly free to describe the church of God, which he, that is God, purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Remember, they were at Ephesus. Paul is at Miletus. They've come from Ephesus down to Miletus to meet him because Paul knew that if he went back to Ephesus, he wouldn't be able to get away very quickly. And he was determined to get to Jerusalem because that's where God had called him to go. So he called for them to come to him. And so they came to him. Someplace close to the wharf, because as Paul leaves the beach there and gets on board the ship, they're, they're crying and praying and waving goodbye to him. They couldn't stay there a long time. They had their wives and their children with them. Paul says, you're going to be attacked from the outside. First warning he gives, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. You're going to be infiltrated. You're going to receive some external attacks. Every church experiences that at some point. But there's also going to be some internal problems. Also, of your own selves shall men arise... What? Of your own selves. Who had he called for to come and meet him there at Miletus? He called the elders of the church. From among the elders of the church, Paul said, there are going to be some, some of you. And Paul's looking at specific people in the crowd. Remember the Last Supper with Jesus? And he had the eleven plus Judas. Those twelve were there. But he said to them, 
one of you, one of you, this night is going to betray me. And they began to ask, is it I? Is it I? I mean, they were worried. They knew that Jesus always told them the truth. And in fact, I suspect some of them were kind of scared. Some of them knew how little their faith was. Jesus said, I'm going to dip some bread here in the, the gravy dish and um, I'm going to hand it to somebody. He's going to dip with me, in fact. And Judas said, so that he wouldn't appear odd among all the other disciples, Lord, is it I? And Jesus said, thou hast said, which in our terminology would be, you said it, brother. Do you realize that even in ministry, in good Bible ministries, I think Jesus had a good Bible ministry. I think Paul had a good Bible ministry. It wasn't because they were defective in their form of ministry. Even there, people can get into positions of leadership who actually have a different spiritual father. From your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That desire for power, that desire to control, that desire to have people listening to you rather than somebody else. Therefore, watch. We won't do it tonight. I hope we'll be able to do it next week or the following week. But we want to talk about what it means to watch. What it means to be vigilant. What it means to have your spiritual antenna up so that you know what's happening around you. Therefore, watch and remember. Ah, Watching is anticipation for the future. Remembering is what did you learn in the past which helps you to understand what's going on in the present so that you will be ready for what happens in the future. Paul's covering all three aspects of that here in this passage. I'm just giving you overviews right now. That by the space of three years, that was one of the longest places Paul ever spent ministry. Three years. That by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Can you imagine listening to Paul for three years and not catching on to what he said? Paul knew that they hadn't, not even the leaders. Everything seemed to be going fine. Everything seemed to be moving along like it should. Why should they worry? Alfred E. Newman, what, me worry? In front of Mad Magazine. I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. I'm not always going to be with you, said Paul. I won't always be here to stand in your defense, to demonstrate who's a heretic and who's an apostate and who isn't. I won't always be here to be able to perform the divine miracles that Paul had the ability to perform. I won't always be here, said the Apostle Paul, to, to catch up the broken pieces when you don't do it right. I won't always be here to cover for you. But God will. I commend you to God. But he didn't leave it with that. He could have said, I commend you to God. Goodbye, guys. He pointed them back to something that is the foundation for every one of us. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Folks, preachers come and go. Preachers live and die. Preachers are here for only a short time. Same with teachers. Same with parents and grandparents who should be teaching you the Word of God. We're only here for a very short time. Compared to eternity, 
we're a blip on the screen. But there is something that abides forever, and it is the Word of God. It is the Word of God's grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You obey the Word of God. Stand on the Word of God. Be faithful to the Word of God. Continue in the Word of God. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Paul expressed what every faithful pastor is willing to do. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul worked to support not only himself, but others too. And like with the Corinthians, he didn't take any money from them. Other churches supported him while he ministered to Corinth. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said. Now, here's the Apostle Paul quoting Jesus, something that was not quoted in the Gospels. Did you know that what Paul says right here, you cannot find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But Jesus said it. And Jesus said it, obviously, to Paul. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, you go all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will not find that there. You know, John ends his epistle, last chapter of the Gospel of John. He says, many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. But he tells us, Jesus said and did a lot of other things that are not recorded in the Gospels. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there and heard and seen and watched all those other things that Jesus did and all those things that he said and been able to sit there and hear everything that he said and be with him every day like the disciples were? Wouldn't you have liked to have grown up with Jesus, say, as one of his half-siblings? <laughs> watched him all the way through childhood. And it would have been very frustrating to you because he never did anything wrong and you were always the one getting the spanking that he wasn't. And all the way through his teenage years, and when all the other teenagers are into the stuff the teenagers ought not to get into, he never got into those things. And then watching him as he was baptized, and then he began his public ministry, and then all those things, more than 30 years worth of things that Jesus said and did, which are not written in this book. God shows specific things that were necessary for us today to know. Here's one of the things that Paul tells us Jesus said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him into the ship. What we have going on here in our passage tonight is Paul is making what we might call his checkup loop after leaving Ephesus. He didn't just stop at one place and go on and never come back. He makes various missionary journeys where he loops back to different locations to check up on the churches. This is the checkup loop, loop, because after leaving Ephesus, Paul traveled, it says in the text, to Macedonia, Greece, back to Macedonia, Asia Minor, and he had key stops at Philippi and at Troas, which is where the Eutychus incident took place. And now we find he's got some other specific stops mentioned in the passage, Assos, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Tregillium, and Miletus. Paul knew that he could not get away with that very short visit to Ephesus, so he planned not to stop, but he did want to see the elders because having the gift of prophecy, he knew that a very savage spiritual attack was going to happen on the church. It was going to be an external attack and an internal attack. They're going to have some quizzlings in their midst. 
by an attack at Ephesus. Ephesus was a center of demonism because of the worship of Diana. Remember the riot? Great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians, and so on. For hours they yelled that. It was center of demon activity where you have major pagan idolatry, you have major demon activity. Paul knew the attack was coming. The passage, as we said, can be approached in at least seven different ways. It can be approached historically. Very important. That's what the book of Acts is. It's history. It can be approached historically so that we can see how divine intersections in life produce lasting results. We talked about divine intersections very, very detailed in Acts chapter 8 where we saw Philip intersecting with the Ethiopian eunuch and how it changed the entire country of Ethiopia for hundreds of years. Divine intersections. We can look at it historically. This can be pro approached prophetically as you read this passage here with Paul talking to the Ephesians. It can be approached prophetically. Things that Paul foretold, some of which apply universally to the church. It can be approached doctrinally. And I've just mentioned a few of these things in passing. This is our overview night tonight. It can be approached doctrinally. The key doctrines that Paul emphasized, which are foundational and which the church needed never to compromise. As you go through this passage, you can see what Paul considered to be important doctrinally so that the church would never get off home base. And the Lord willing, next week we'll be talking about some of that. Number four, this passage can be approached personally. That means the cost of serving in ministry both to those who minister and to those who received ministry. Do you understand the breaking of the hearts of people at the end of this passage when they say goodbye to Paul for the last time? There was a personal bond of love and fellowship there was an intense desire to have Paul with them. We see some ways in which God worked to alleviate that sorrow and how God deals with our personal needs in life in this text. Number five, it can be approached as a study of the impelling and I use that word advisedly, impelling will of God. Where you are driven by the will of God and you know it's the will of God and you know you are walking by faith and you know that you are in the center of God's will and it doesn't seem to make sense. But you know it's the will of God and you are driven and driven and driven. That is the impelling will of God. And we see that the Apostle Paul is always so much spiritually alert that he knows precisely what he is doing is the will of God, even though every place he has gone, every church that he's been, every one of them has got prophets in it that says, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, bad things are going to happen. Paul says, I know, but I have to go. But it's going to be horrible things that happen to you, Paul. Yes, I know, but i got to go. It's the will of God. We can look at this passage as a study of the impelling will of God. Paul knowing what he had to do, even though there were other things that he might have preferred to do, even though he knew that bad things were going to happen, he knew it was the will of God. Number six, this passage can be approached as a guide for finishing the end of a ministry and the end of life. It can be approached as a guide for finishing the end of a ministry and for finishing the end of a life and finishing well. I know it bores you to hear me tell about the days that I used to be a runner. <laughs> but you know every runner wants to finish the race well. You don't want to come staggering across the finish line and collapse. You don't want to come in walking the last 100 yards because you don't have any more strength. 
or because you really want to have a little strength to be able to go out and have hamburgers afterwards. You want to finish the race well. If you've ever been an athlete, you know you want to finish well. You want to finish well. And at the end of Paul's life, he could say to Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have finished my race well. I have kept the faith. Will you be able to say that at the end of your life, at the end of your ministry, at the end of your time here on earth? Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, there are judges of the races, there is a righteous judge for our race, shall give unto me, and not unto me only. <laughs> Did you know Paul included you in that verse? But also unto all them that love his appearing. How are you running your race? When you begin to see the finish line in the distance, will you have run your race well? And will you finish well? Will you give that last kick into the finish line where you give it all your guts? Where you don't hold back anything? Where you break through the tape with your chest and the blood is dripping out of your mouth because you have put so much into it? Or we sort of lollygag across the finish line and give a little wave. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me at that day, and not unto me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. So the passage can be approached as a guide for finishing the end of a ministry and the end of a life well. Seventh and finally, it can be approached <laughs> as a crash course instructing church leadership. It can be approached as a crash course instructing church leadership. How much Paul pours into the few words that we have in these 25 verses. crash course, almost a whole seminary course, when you begin to follow through everything that Paul says there and realize what Paul taught the Ephesians in the three years that he was there and what Paul wrote in the six chapters of the book of Ephesians, which went back to that church. He puts it all together in these few words that he speaks when the elders come to him at Miletus, a crash course in instructing church leaderships. Leadership. Now, as we go through that passage, and our time is up for tonight, I've given you only an overview. But as we go through it, I'm going to be mixing those seven different approaches in going through the passage so that we can get through those things that each one of us, 2,000 years later, need to know to finish our course well. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of looking at your word, for studying your word, for having it in our own language, being able to apply it directly to life. Make us men and women of God, men who are committed to the will of God, men who are obedient in caring for our families, men and women who are obedient as parents, caring for our children, women who are obedient in the crafts and skills and talents that you've given to us, children who are obedient to our parents and obedient to the word of God, to study it, learn it, memorize it, meditate upon it, consistently apply it, and seek to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. People, all of us, no matter what age, who earnestly desire to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord, for we have the guarantee that someday we will stand before Christ and we will give an account for how we have run our race. May we run it with boldness. May we keep the faith. May we look forward with joy 
to crossing the finish line. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now if I can find my little piece of paper here.